It's just another night for Supernatural Girls. Real stories, real answers to life's biggest supernatural mysteries. And now for another exciting interview with paranormal experts from this world and others. Here's your host, paranormal researcher Patricia Baker, on the one, the only, Supernatural Girls. Welcome, everyone, to another exciting episode of Supernatural Girls Radio. I'm your host, Patricia Baker, and I am here with my lovely co-host, all the way from Tucson, Patricia Kirkman, PK. How are you tonight? Absolutely fabulous. We have had such a wonderful week in the high 80s, low 90s. (laughs) Oh, rub it in. (laughs) It's okay. It's it's going to start (laughs) raining on Sunday, and then it'll cool down after that. But I have enjoyed every minute of this. Well, you deserve it. That's good. Nice warm weather. We -hmm. both had a great Thanksgiving, and we were able to have some good food, put our feet up, and relax a little bit. We had a great pre-recorded show last week that IRN was uh, kind enough to air for us with Robert Mm -hmm. Abitello and talked all about... The Alternative Medicine Way to Go with Lyme and Autoimmune. It was a great amount of a very information. Very good show. Yes, I had it was. quite a few of my people call and tell me how much they enjoyed it. Good, good, good. Very well, much so. we, we reposted the link in case you missed it, and you can also eventually, in the next week or so, we'll have it up on our archives. You can mm-hmm. listen to it there or on the IRN archives. So it will be available. And we've got a big lineup coming your way in December, but tonight we have a very special guest who we love. We love this guy, don't we? Yes, Nick we do, for Redford. sure. Redford. Oh, he writes about all the stuff we love, and tonight we're talking about his new book, Shapeshifters, Morphing Monsters, and Changing Cryptids. We both it have a is. beautiful it, copy, and we're displaying it to you all right now. It so is a great it. book. It's a great read. Well, he's got these stories here I've never even heard of. I mean, oh, I can't wait to get him on the air and talk about all this stuff. It, it's remarkable. He's done a tremendous amount of research. Mm-hmm. He, he really did dig deep, and he came up with some incredible stuff. So we're going to have him share all of this with all of us tonight. But first, we got to check in. We've got some wedding plan news, right? You were looking yes, into yes, we do. the future newlyweds. Well, What's up with them? the nice thing about it is I took a look at her real name is Rachel Megan Markle. So I took a look at her overall. Very balanced young lady. She really does. She's learning how to deal with family type situations. And that makes sense considering her family dynamics when she was growing up. The mother, father's divorce, separations and such. So she's they're here to learn how to work it better. But she has had that marriage earlier, married a person in her seven year, which says, forget it, you really don't know what you're doing, and divorced in her nine years, said, I got out of it, it's done. But her situation with uh, Prince Harry, timing is perfect for both of them, because she is in her two, he going into the six, twos and six are when relationships are made. And they have a very good combination between the two of them. Both of them are very caring, very outgoing, but also very helpful people. So that means a lot. Uh, He's more headstrong than she is. Both of them are extremely flexible. He's a little more anal than she is, believe it or not, which surprised me because he's such a, uh, uh, what would we call it? Free spirit. Yes, (laughs) definitely. He's been very much a free spirit, but he works it in a different way. So it it was very interesting looking at the two of them. So it's going to be interesting because I think that they will be uh, not equally so as William and Kate, maybe more so than William and Kate when it comes to working with the population. No kidding. Uh Well, that's we all wish them the best. Um, They haven't been accused of being shapeshifters like uh, William and Kate have been (laughs) and the Queen. So we'll see what happens as time goes on. Oh, my. So, okay. Well, that's very interesting. 
Now, Paranormal News, we have an article on our Facebook page. Mm -hmm. Be sure to go there, uh, like us and follow us so you can catch all this news. I have all kinds of stuff for all of us to look at. But the story that really caught my eye was the one about John Lennon. Now, didn't yes. that surprise you? I, my that God. shocked me. That really yes. shocked me. Yes. And now, he here he was. He's in his house in the middle of the night. These aliens come into his room, and he has this interaction with them as far as he can tell. Uh, then he wakes up in the morning, and he's got something in his hand. Mm -hmm. He's got a golden metal looking egg in his hand mm -hmm. that they gave him now we have had yuri geller on our show right and yuri talked to john about this apparently interviewed john about this and john told him all the details of the events and what happened and he said yoko believed him that she felt this had really happened mm -hmm. but he knew it really happened because he had this thing in his hand yeah but he pulls it out of his pocket and he gives it to Yuri Geller. And he says, I don't want this thing. It could be mm -hmm. a ticket to another world. I'm not interested. You take it. Now, what I find interesting is Yuri Geller is still alive. Mm -hmm. John Lennon isn't. I wonder, was that egg given to him to protect him? Oh, that could very well that have been. Very well have been. my little mind, you know. And I was wondering about that. And I was... Wow, you know, maybe he gave away something that wasn't meant to be given away. Hmm. Something That's, that was there really gives you important. something to think about, doesn't it? Yeah. No, well, yeah. I mean, they don't give things lightly. That's for sure. These no. aliens. Very rarely do you hear them having physically given anything. Yeah, Very they take, but they don't yeah. like to give. Mm -hmm. from what well, and it was like uh, like uh, Yoko Ono had mentioned. He said. Well, she knew I would never lie to her because she kind of looked at him kind of strangely, but she knew right. that he would never tell her anything other than the truth. So that was another thing. Someone said, well, was it on drugs? No, it was He okay. was on top of the covers so afterwards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Crazy. I was shocked reading that story. I was very intrigued by it. That's on our Facebook page, everybody. You can go and read it for yourself. It's it's very interesting. And then, of course, we have all these booms going off all across yes. the world. Some people are saying it's seismic shifts, and other people are saying we don't know what the hell it is, but it's scaring us. So we don't know what it is. Is this uh, the trumpet, Gabriel's trumpet, giving us a warning? I don't know. Well, especially with South Korea having North to put up Korea. with what North Korea is doing. Yeah. yeah. I feel sorry for them because they're in such a vulnerable positioning. Yes, and Japan. And we are now two, by the way. So. Yes. I, I was kind of hoping that. that, you know, I wish the people in power would take a look, another look and quit playing with their trigger fingers. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, this is it's getting too many to buttons. The red alert. Too many buttons. Yeah. This is going into from yellow alert to red alert. So, anyways, yeah. we all need to keep saying prayers and asking for help from the other side of the universe and Wouldn't also nice? you know i think all these monsters need to help us out too that we're going to be talking about they need to get useful don't you think well they probably are more so than we <laughs> were aware of because i'll tell you what if somebody was acting out and a few of them stood up in front of them that would quiet them down in a hurry you don't know, you think it might work yes yeah. i think it would work quite well i wonder but, if we could send a couple of them in on a little journey <laughs> to North Korea. I think they should go. What a yes. thought. They could take over, and that would be fine with me. So <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. Well, let's, let's talk about Nick, because he is a stellar guest. We've had yes. him on the show a couple yes, of times yes. before, and it's always just a delightful evening. So he is the author of more than 30 books on UFOs, Incredible. Bigfoot and cryptozoology, including Monster Files, Memoirs of a Monster Hunter, The Real Men in Black, and he has appeared on more than 70 television shows, including the Sci-Fi Channel's Proof Positive and the History Channel's Ancient Aliens. I saw Nick on Ancient Aliens. He did a great job, and now he's with us. We are so blessed. Yes. So, Nick, welcome to the show. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me on again. Oh, we're great so having you. 
Woo. Yeah. So happy to have you here. So oh, this this book is great. We highly recommend it to everybody. We couldn't put it down. I mean, there's just story after. This is like a having a, a nutrient dense meal because there's so much <laughs> going on in this book. It's great. It's just definitely great. A, definitely a treasure trove. <laughs> Oh, it is. And you start out now with werewolves, one of my favorite, favorite topics. So let's start there. Now, um, any recent werewolf stories? I mean, a lot of these are from days of old, but has there been anything recently that's popped up? Well, yeah, there's actually quite a few reports that uh, some researchers think fall into the werewolf category, but today people refer to them as dogmen. It's like dogmen is almost like a politically correct term for werewolf, you know. Um, <laughs> the idea that you'd start talking about werewolves, people kind of roll their eyes, you know. But if you talk about the dog right. man as a phenomenon, it's a little bit different because the people describe this thing that, it, for all intents and purposes, sounds like a werewolf. We're talking about like a, an upright wolf-like animal. But what's interesting is that although the old legends talk about you know, the werewolves being shapeshifters, with the dogman phenomenon, there's hardly a single report where they've shapeshifted. People have described seeing a, like a very large wolf, but which has the ability to walk on its back legs as well as on all four legs, which does it give it kind of like a humanoid type appearance. And uh, Linda Godfrey, who's written a number of books on the whole uh, dogman phenomenon, <clears throat> She sort of looked at the idea that these are something sort of paranormal, maybe multi and inter, inter, interdimensional, that kind of thing. And um, so there's a lot of controversy surrounding things like stories of werewolves and dogmen, purely and simply because most people think of werewolves, they think of Hollywood movies and silver yeah. bullets and the full moon. Whereas the reality, you know, I is very different in the sense that people report these upright wolf-like animals, but they don't talk about seeing, you know, a person bursting out of the clothes at a full moon or whatever. It's, so there's a lot of substantial differences, um, you know, between the, the folklore and what people actually report. So Dogman doesn't morph into a human form. Dogman is just Dogman. Yeah, some people think, you know, they wonder on or speculate on the idea could they be um like prehistoric wolves now there were some uh wolves which became extinct thousands and thousands of years ago one uh, known as the dire wolf and there have been rumors of people seeing these huge dire wolves right to the present day and they may still exist now they didn't have the ability to rear up on their hind legs but some animals do like for ex a classic example would be a grizzly bear you know they run on all fours but they will stand up on their back legs and they will walk along you know um and so some people think that the could there be sort of an ancient type of wolf still existing in the united states which if it feels threatened or if it wants to intimidate or frighten a person it rears up on its hind legs now there is not I should I should stress, you know, there isn't an example we can say that that is provable, but that's one of the theories that's been put forward that, that perhaps, you know, as I said, like a grizzly bear, they can briefly rear up on their back legs. And if you saw them, if you saw them briefly, you know, late at night in the shadows, teetering on their back legs, and he's got this sort of long muzzle and pointed ears, you might just thought, think you'd seen a real werewolf rather than perhaps... Mm -hmm you know, an unusual type of wolf that we haven't classified properly yet. That's interesting. Now, mm -hmm. and there is a show, um, you may have heard of it, called Paranormal Witness. It's actually produced by uh, people from the UK. And they had a show, it was a reenactment, actually, of something that occurred out in uh, the western part of the United States where these people tracked this man um, who had shown up at their the back door looking like very wolf-like and they tracked him through the snow to a small cabin and he wasn't there but what was there was a room with scratches on the wall 
and chains on the wall, just like you would expect a, somebody who was changing into, were, into a werewolf and wants to control himself would have in their house. There was nothing else mm. in the house. There was no food. There was nothing else. But they tracked him there, and he had very weird-looking eyes. Uh, he did have a job in an auto shop, but he lived alone. He had no friends, and again, you know, people had seen him outside their homes looking very wolf-like, and then to find this in his house. He died eventually, and the police went into the house, and they found the same thing these guys had found. So it is entirely possible that there are still werewolves, right? Yeah, I mean, one of the cases that I cover in the book, it's not its not completely up to date, but it's actually not sort of like most people think, you know, the 1700s and 1800s. There was actually um, a very famous wave of sightings in, 19, in the summer of 1972 in the Ohio town of Defiance. Oh, Defiance, now, yes. Yeah. Now, if you Google Defiance, Ohio werewolf, 1972, you'll see a lot of stories. And what happened was that a number of guys who were working on the railroad, the railroad runs through the town itself. They were doing shift works. And um, one of the guys from the early hours of the morning saw this upright figure, thought it was a man at first, then realized um, the clothes were kind of tattered. And instead of having a regular head and face, it had, it, it had a head like a German shepherd. And... Mm. Obviously, you know, he, he fled the scene immediately. But there are seven or eight examples where the, um, the railroad workers had seen this creature prowling around. And then, interestingly enough, kind of similar to the story that you just mentioned, people heard these scrapings and scratching noise on their front door in the early hours of the morning. And even the local police got involved. And they took it seriously because they actually opened a file, an official file, to investigate these cases and these reports. And um, and they, you know, they stayed up through the night and um, you know, sort of patrolled the area. So it was taken very, very seriously. And even the local press didn't laugh at it because they realised that people were seeing something at least, and the, the the police were involved, and the railroad staff and. You know, these weren't anonymous sources that couldn't be tracked down. These were, you know, local people in town that everybody knew. So it was really, for about six weeks, it was almost like a, like a state of fear descended on defiance purely and simply because of these sort of weird werewolf-type encounters. That's, that was a great story in the book, and, mm -hmm. and I was surprised to see that it happened in 72, as you mentioned. It's... Uh, much more current. And again, I think that there may be other stories like this. But when you go to find these stories, how do you find them? I mean, do people just come to you or do you go digging for them? How do you find them? Well, it's a bit of both, really. I mean, very often, you know, I like to do research and investigate things. So sometimes, you know, I'll go out and look, you know, for, the, for, these, for these cases and witnesses and, you know, travel around. Uh, but other cases, you know, it, it is a um, situation where very often people might have been, you know, listening to a radio show like tonight, and then um, the next day they're like, oh, well, that sounds like what I saw. So then they'll, you know, either email me or send me a Facebook message. So, you know, that does actually make it a lot easier because people do, you know, um, share their story, which obviously, you know, I'm grateful and pleased for because without the witnesses, we've got nothing to go on. You know, the witnesses mm -hmm. are always the most important people in these cases because without the witnesses and without them coming forward, we've got uh, nothing to go on. So um, so I do get a lot of people contact me about their experiences, um, you know, and then I, I chat with them uh, if they're willing to chat and talk. And, you know, so um, as I said, that does make it easier. And also, you know, you become a good judge of character you get to know the people and um you know understand them etc so um it's not just a matter of sort of collecting the stories it's it's sort of um gaining the trust of the witness as well you know when they realize they're not going to be laughed at or whatever that's an important part yeah. of that that you yeah. take them seriously so i'd yeah. imagine again with your reputation that precedes you they do feel comfortable talking to you about these things so thank goodness for that now i have a question for you from the chat room this is from shimmering lights who's saying 
Hi, Nick. What is the oldest story with werewolf sightings? Um, well, the oldest one, I mean, you can go, well, you can actually go back thousands of years and you can find throughout numerous cultures where they had like dog headed gods uh, or wolf headed gods. Uh, I mean, a perfect example would be Anubis, you know, the, the Egyptian god, which is very right. much um, sort of dog like. But of course, the big question is should we interpret those as werewolves or is it something that's completely different? Um, but what are, in terms of sort of definitive um, werewolf type stories, the earliest that I've personally investigated. Um, occurred about 1,100 years ago in England and in a little town called Flixton. And uh, there was a story there of like a, a magician-type character who supposedly had the ability to transform himself into a wolf. So that's like a, a classic example. That's, that's very, very old. Now, it didn't have the sort of the issues of the full moon and all that kind of thing, but it was, you know, in essence, like shape-shifting. Now, stories of shape-shifters do go back thousands of years, you know, where people believe they could take on different forms um, and, you know, sort of rampage around the woods, etc., in classic fashion. But that, that's the earliest one I've looked into. But, but it is important to note that sort of dog-headed creatures or entities do play big roles in, in ancient religions. Yes, they do. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely true. And... Well, let's let's go forward in your book. I, the heads. Can you talk to us about the heads? Those two heads the kids yes. dug up. That was a oh, wild yeah. one. Wow. Yeah. Well, funnily enough, that was also 1972, which was the year ah. of the Defiance Werewolf. But the the case you're talking about has become it's an English case in north of England uh, called the Hexham Heads, and Hexham is a little town in the north of England, and. Basically what happened, two young boys in uh, the school holidays just playing outside in the backyard and they decided to, you know, just dig around, dig holes and while they were playing, you know. And they found these two strange carved heads um, mm -hmm. which were sort of made out of stone, about the size of like a tennis ball, something like that. And one looked to be carved in the face of like a male figure and the other one female. And... Um, they thought it was just, you know, cool little carved stones. And um, and so contact was made with sort of like local archaeologists and people like that, and the, the press soon got onto the story. And um, then it was, it was actually confirmed that these were sort of of Celtic origin, um, you know, going back thousands of years, and they may have been used in sort of fertility rites or sacrificial rites, that kind of thing. But everybody who handled these stone heads got a really weird vibe from them, you know, kind of an unsettling look on the face where people almost felt, felt like the stones were alive somehow. What's particularly weird is that um, whenever anybody would take them into their home, uh, str <clears throat> strange things would happen. Now, one of them was a, a woman named Dr. Anne Ross, and she was an expert in um, Celtic history and Celtic archaeology, you know, going back thousands of years in Scotland and Ireland, places like that. And when she took these um, stones, the Hexham's heads, into her house, um, she woke up on the first night in the middle of the night to see this upright wolf-like creature looming over the bed. Wow. And, um, she said as she woke up, it sort of raced out the room, and it was like a two-floor two, uh, um, house, and it bounded over the staircase and ran down the staircase and out the door. Um, various other people um, who also, over the years, had access to the heads reported very similar things. They'd wake up in the night and again see this wolf-like thing looking at them, and it was as if actually sort of possessing the head somehow manifested these almost like a supernatural type of a werewolf you know not a physical creature as such but more more like a, a phantom but looking like a werewolf which you know they would vanish and appear and vanish and appear and so on um and over the years various researchers um looked after the heads and most of them were just wanted gone of them 
eventually. <laughs> yeah. And today, yeah, we don't you know take when them. you've been... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we bury them. <laughs> and, but uh, today, nobody knows where the originals are. A few copies are made, which are in various people's hands, mm -hmm. but we don't know where the originals are. But, um, I mean, the boys today, they're sort of, sort of mid to late 50s now, something like that. Um, and, you know, they've, they've since come forward, but it... He was covered in the newspapers at the time, but then he got forgotten about and then picked up years later. But that's sort of a, like I said, a spooky story, these sort of old carved heads which people got this sort of really creepy feeling from, you know. Yeah, and it allowed these things to, to come through, like that big wolf creature on two legs. Yeah, and I mean, I it sounds like that was connected to it. Yeah, I think that's actually part mm -hmm. of the story, the idea that, you know, you take them in the home... And it's almost as if you open a doorway, kind of similar to somebody using like a Ouija board, you know, you, mm -hmm. you open a portal or a doorway. And I think that's what happened um, with the Hexham heads, that somehow just possessing them um, allowed this, this phenomenon, if you like, of these wolf-headed figures, it allowed them to come through, you know, it was almost like a permission kind of thing. Exactly, exactly. Well, what a strange story that was. I love that one. That's great. Here's another question from the chat room. This is from Carrie Remington, who's asking, are these shapeshifters first human who transformed into animals or animals who become humans? Well, that's a good question because in some cases... Um, well, it's hard to say because you don't know what the original form is. You know, if some of these creatures are strange creatures to begin with, but they could take on human form, a lot of people don't actually think of that. You know, they always think of a person turning into a werewolf or, or a vampire. They don't right. think of it the other way around, you know, which is kind of interesting that people don't think of it the other way around. But um, yes. there are actually some cases, which I talk about in the book, where the creature itself never actually took on the form of um, of a person. Um, there's some cases where people saw these weird creatures and they morphed into like a ball of light uh, or, or the ball of light morphed into a strange creature. So sometimes people aren't even in the equation, you know. Um, but for the, for the most part, the ones that I've got, um, the I guess the inference is that, um, you know, they're people who were able to take on animal form. But um, as I said, there are a few cases, particularly something like Native American legends, like where the coyote, for example, is supposedly a shapeshifter, but they could take mm -hmm. on human form. Um, mm -hmm. So, but, but for the most part, yeah, it is sort of um, the human ch turns into the creature. Gosh, it's just, there's so many creatures. I had no idea. I mean, we are familiar with a lot of them, but you have mentioned things here we've never heard of. So, again, I want to highly recommend your book. It is Shapeshifters, Morphing Monsters and Changing Cryptids. And right. for those of you watching us on video, you can see the book here. It, it is. is just filled with, this would be a great Christmas gift for people into oh, this stuff. Yes. Because, yeah, it is just loaded with things that uh, you wouldn't, wouldn't normally hear about even on well, Facebook. Well, so. and it's intriguing as you get into it because you can't wait to see what the next part of it's going to be. Exactly, exactly. The stories are great, Nick. You've done a terrific job. Oh, so, um, yeah, we are going to take a very short break. Don't forget to visit us on Facebook at SupernaturalGirlsWithAZ.com. Visit our website, SupernaturalGirls.com, and also sign up for our newsletter. Mm -hmm. And be sure to contact PK and myself if you'd like any readings. PK is running a special. She's going to talk about that right after the break. So we will be right back, I promise, with Nick Redfern. Yes. Welcome back, everyone, to Supernatural Girls Radio. I'm your host, Patricia Baker. I am here with my co-host, Patricia Kirkman, PK, and our guest tonight, Nick Redfern. And before we share more with Nick and ask him about more of these stories, mm -hmm. Patricia Kirkman, you are offering something special for the holidays. I wanted to give you a chance to please tell us all about it. 
Well, it's very simple. I'm offering whoever is interested a hour reading. Usually they're $150. <clears throat> Excuse me. And at this time, I'm going to charge only $100 for the reading gift certificates to use for gifts for those that are interested. And it's something that I do every once in a while, and it's only good from now until the 16th of December. Okay. So, I, so you, you get to save yourself a third so you can take them out for lunch, too. <laughs> That's a great gift. Sure. Very nice. Very nice. And you're giving readings also. Available. I give readings all the time, yes. Right. So whoever would like a reading with me, they can contact me right from the website, supernaturalgirlswithaz.com, mm -hmm. as well as they can you. We are both hot linked right. on there, so you can send us a message and tell us what, you're, what kind of support you're looking for. We're happy to help. Oh, so definitely. here's another, yeah, and it's coming to the holidays, so... Here we have another question, Nick, for you, and this is from Tom Rader, who's saying, what about shape-shifting into cat-like animals? Is that more rare than dogs? Hmm. Well, actually, I've got a, an entire chapter on that in the book, and they're known as were-cats. Um, you know, people think of werewolves, but there are stories of <clears throat> were-cats, were-tigers, mm -hmm. were-hyenas, all sorts in different cultures around the world. And I actually do have several stories of... Um, of what you would call wear cats. Now, Africa, for example, they have long standing traditions of what are known as leopard men. Um, mm -hmm. Now, in some cases, the, the, the leopard men, it's more of a symbolic thing where tribal members will sort of dress up um, in the form of like a leopard or a tiger. And sometimes, you know, they'll um, have the, the skin of one, the hide of one of the animals over them. And the, the imagery becomes part of their, you know, their, their, their rituals. But there are other stories of, uh, like, shamanic people, you know, um, in these cultures who claim that they can physically transform into a sort of a human slash cat-like animal. Now, as bizarre as it sounds, there are more than a few of these cases on record. Um, I talk about one case in the UK um, back in the 1970s um, in the English county of Devon where a guy was out walking his dog and saw this large black cat. Um, I guess the closest thing would be something like a, like a black leopard. You know, this was like the size of a mountain lion, which we do get a lot of reports like this in the UK, but there should not be any, you know, large big cats roaming around the UK at all. But right. people see them. Mm -hmm. But some of these cases are kind of weird. And in this case... The witness said he just kind of stood there, stunned for a second. He grabbed the dog, you know, picked the dog up. Um, and then suddenly this black cat kind of literally morphed and transformed where its back legs changed to where it could stand up comfortably on its hind legs. Mm. And he said it had this, its face kind of took on a semi-human look and it kind of leered at him, like sneered at him almost. And... Mm. It sort of really terrified him, and he just, you know, he just fled the scene, and uh, which is probably <laughs> probably not a bad thing to do. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, but right. I mean, there are a lot of stories like this. I mean, another one that I talk about, <coughs> excuse me, um, in relation to these cases, uh, one I've got from uh, from Oregon. Now, this uh, was from a woman named Jennifer who contacted me, and she told me how in 2011. She saw one of these things um, literally racing across the road. Um, she'd been out with a few friends, and where she lived was just around the corner. So she walked home, and she saw this creature, which she could only describe as like um, like a large human-like cat. That's the best way I can describe it, standing on its hind legs and racing across the road into the shadows. And... Um, I mean, she was terrified by it. She went, you know, when she told me the story, it was just as clear and as scary to her uh, as it was when I interviewed her versus, you know, when this occurred back in 2011. Um, but werecat stories, yeah, you can find them all around the world. And one of the things most of the stories have in common, if not all that they all have in common, is the angle of these things somehow being evil. People actually say they kind of get a sense of evil from them. You know, kind of that feeling when you meet someone for the first time and, 
you've never met him, you don't know anything about him, but you get a weird vibe from him, you know, something you don't yes. like about the person. We've all done that from time to time. Oh, yeah. But you imagine that kind of, you imagine that sort of magnified in relation to fear, you know, that's, that's what most people say. They just sensed a feeling of fear, but they just didn't know why. It wasn't just the fact that it looked weird and creepy. It was, it was almost like it was emanating evil, well, you know, some sort of yeah. evilness, if you like. In, in all the collections of these stories and interviewing people, have you ever come across anybody who was able to get past their fear and the shock of seeing something so strange that was able to kind of take a breath and try to communicate with it? Um, well, the, uh, the only one I can think of um, was in relation to one of these large black cats. Now, it doesn't relate to actually the shape-shifting angle, but I did speak to a guy once who was uh, actually, funnily enough, out walking his dog again, um, and everybody walks their dogs around England. So, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, he told me how they were walking by an old canal, and suddenly this large black cat came round the corner, and he said he was so stunned. Um, he didn't know what to do. He just he said hello <laughs> to this big black cat. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> you know, I, I, guess, I guess when you're kind of plunged into that position, you don't really know what you would do. And he just kind of like stopped. You know, I guess his jaw dropped, and he says hello. <laughs> and, um, but I mean, he didn't get attacked or anything. He just backed away, and the cat kind of just stared him out, you know, uh, telling him who was boss, I guess, but, um, <laughs> but you know, it, 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 it's things like that that, um, you know, for me are important because it kind of humanizes the experience, you know, you realize that it, it's not a hoax because it's the kind of thing we all might do, you know, when you're just exactly. faced with that unpredictable situation, yes. you're like, oh, <laughs> I mean, yeah. let me give you an example, I mean, um, the apartments where I live, um, this is kind of almost identical, you know, I, I live on a second floor, so when I go down to get the mail, there's like a, a, a white cat here that everybody feeds, so I get down the bottom of the steps, and every morning, you know, he'll go, he'll meow four or five times, so he'll meow, meow once, I'll go, hey, and he'll meow again, I'll go, hey. <laughs> 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 so I guess I kind of do the same, you know, really. But yeah. The only difference oh, being that the white cat here doesn't shape shift. So. <laughs> that's a good At least thing. not yet, anyway. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah, that's well, funny. here's another question for you, Nick. This is from Supernova. Do you think any of these creatures may be a part of a black op government experiment gone wrong? Um. Well, I mean, I I have had heard that theory. Um. Not so much in relation to shape shifting, but in relation to weird creatures in general. For example, I've been on a lot of expeditions to Puerto Rico looking for the original chupacabra, mm -hmm. and um, or chupacabras, and um, I've heard a lot of stories there about military programs and underground labs where supposedly research was done to, you know, genetically alter regular animals into these sort of um, chupacabra type creatures. I've heard a lot of stories about experiments being undertaken on Puerto Rico involving monkeys and chimpanzees um, to mutate them into something else which could be unleashed on the battlefield, you know, like some sort of killing mm. machine. Now, obviously, you know, those stories are extremely controversial. The idea of literally being, to, being able to genetically alter you know, a creature into something else. I mean, as far as our science, medicine, and technology is concerned, we cannot do that. But, you know, who knows what's going on behind the scenes in terms of what somebody else could have achieved, you know. I mean, things like gene splicing and, um, you know, sort of mixing genes from one creature to another, which is actually going on now, then you could well understand if somebody secretly is 20 or 30 years ahead of the rest of us in terms of science, then it's not out of the, um, you know, out, of, out of the possibility. But I have heard of quite a few stories like that, particularly in relation to the Chupacabra, as I said, and also um, some of the uh, Skinwalker type reports and things like that, the idea that the military might be interested in this kind of phenomenon.
Yeah, and they also might have creatures that have gotten loose because I know there was a story about people swimming in a lake out in the Midwest and they were attacked by a very strange creature that scratched them up really badly. Mm -hmm. And they left that site in a hurry, but then they were visited by several military people and told never to talk about it which, of course, they did talk about it, thank goodness, because that's how we heard the story. But, again, so you may, you know, it makes me wonder, is this one of theirs that got loose and now they're following up and trying to cover their own tracks? So it is possible. Yeah, but a lot of those stories, you know, like escapees, that sort of thing, that's what I heard a lot in Puerto Rico on, you know, in terms of, oh, they escaped and they're running around and they're responsible for the, you know, the Chupacabra report. So, um I heard some really weird stuff about, um, I don't know if you've ever seen the, the movie 28 Days Later, which is um, it made about 15, 16 years ago. It's a zombie movie set in England where these um, chimpanzees are being used in experiments and they, the scientists create what they call the rage virus and they inject it into these chimpanzees and it sends them crazy, you know, they kill anybody. Mm-hmm. You know, the idea is to unleash them on the battlefield against the enemy, but what happens is the virus gets out into the, the population of the UK and the UK's quarantine because you've got all these people running around like crazed zombies because they're all infected with the rage virus. Now, I actually heard something very similar to that um, in one of my earlier trips to Puerto Rico where people said that um, chimpanzees and monkeys were being used in sort of mind-altering um, experiments, you know, to, to try and turn a friendly little monkey into sort of a... A rampaging killing machine, you know. That's horrible. Well, yeah. and how how would you tell who's the good guy, who's the bad guy if you turn them loose? How do they know the difference? Well, I mean, well, I mean, if you get your throat torn out, I guess they're the bad ones. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you don't make it, that's the bad one. No, but I mean, how, when they. Yeah, how would they know which side they're after? On the exactly. battlefield, it's hard to tell. Oh, who's I see what you mean. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, that's actually a really good point. I mean, I think the only way you, if, if the stories are true, I think the only way you could use that as a weapon would be if only the enemy were on the battlefield, you know, because if your own troops were there, then they're probably just going to attack them as well. So I think the only way they could ever gain anything would be, you know, to release them somehow and to make sure that none of our side was there, you know. Um, yeah, that would be the only way. No, right. That would be the only way because, the yeah, because that would be, yeah, they wouldn't suddenly think, oh, they're the good guys, we'll leave them alone. <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> little white hat. Yeah, the the you know, put, put a little scent on them so they know which one's the good guy and which <laughs> the bad one. <laughs> well, here's another question for you. Uh, this, let's see, oh, what everything just dropped down a second. Um, there was an old movie, this is from Squatch Detective, with James Earl Jones shape-shifting into a snake in Conan the Barbarian. Was this an early look into shape-shifting reptilians that the UFO talk about now, UFO people talk about now, or is this in the cryptid research field? So where does it belong, UFO or cryptid? Mm. Well, it's interesting because sometimes we actually get crossovers between things that go on in the UFO field and that go on in cryptozoology. For example, there have been cases where people have seen strange lights in the sky hovering over woods where people at the exact same time and place have seen Bigfoot-type creatures. Um, There are a number of Chupacabra cases from Puerto Rico where people saw UFOs in conjunction with the Chupacabra. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it could be a similar situation when you're talking about the reptilians and I mean I actually have a a chapter in the book that talks about the reptilians and probably one of the creepiest cases of all that I've got because it deals with two very weird phenomena and um, involves a woman I interviewed a couple of years ago who lives in Point Pleasant West Virginia which ironically is where all the original Mothman sightings began in the 60s but she had a really weird experience where Late one night, she was just watching TV, like 11 o'clock at night, and there was this loud knock on the door, you know, three or four knocks, and she was was like, well, who on earth is that, you know? So she kind of crept to the door, looked through the spy hole, and saw these two kids there wearing black hoodies, and they looked really pale, 
and they tried to find a way to get into the house and um, so they were hungry, they were lost, etc., etc. And she just, again, kind of like with a lot of these phenomena, she, she got this weird vibe from them. And then they suddenly looked up at her, and they both got these solid black eyes, and this is Ugh. known as the black eye children mm -hmm. phenomenon. And there's all sorts of different theories to what they are, you know, paranormal, alien, human hybrids, demonic, you know, the, the list mm -hmm. goes on and on. But what was really weird, she said that as she stared at them, it was almost suddenly after a few seconds that, you know, like when you're driving your car and it's like really hot and there's a heat haze where the road kind of ripples. Um, and it was like that where they, they sort of rippled. And she said they changed literally before on the other side of the door into like these eight foot tall lizard type creatures. Oh, and, um, wow. and I mean, yeah. And, and obviously, you know, it scared the life out of her. And she, mm -hmm. What she basically did was to just run to the furthest part of the apartment away from the door. And finally, I think after a couple of hours, she went back to the door and no, nothing was there at all, the kids or the the reptilians. But, um, but that was like a really creepy one. And I got to um, see her personally at one of the um, Mothman festivals, which I spoke at. And... Um, you know, she came across as just a normal, credible person, but telling an incredible story. And, um, you know, she didn't come across crazy or, you know, anything like that. Just had a really weird story, was, was very concerned about not going on the record. And I said, that's fine. I said, you know, I'm, I totally understand why sometimes people don't want to go on the record. But, um, yeah, I mean, it was just one of those bizarre, strange stories. But... Um, you know, the reptilian angle is an interesting one because it's certainly grown in the last 20 years or so, particularly, you know, with the whole British royal family thing. Now, personally, I'm, I'm actually not a fan of the royal family. I think they're kind of outdated, but, um, uh -huh. but I don't personally mm -hmm. think they are reptiles, no. But what I do believe is that there is a genuine reptilian phenomenon. I mean, I've in interviewed a lot of people who have swore, you know, they saw somebody like step this is very often what happens somebody gets that feeling we all get from time to time when you think somebody's mm -hmm. looking at you you know you're in the checkout line at the store and you think someone's looking and you turn around and somebody is watching you you know right. 30 feet of <laughs> we can all do that even if we don't know why it works uh, but we all have that kind of sense and i've right. had a few cases where people said they kind of looked at this person and it was as if the person was a reptilian and they realized that the the human knew there was something odd about them you know as if their camouflage had been blown and so what they did they allowed them to see their real form you know like a reptilian very briefly for a couple of seconds and then change back again oh my sort of really, goodness he, yeah so it kind of really freaked out the witness you know as if the, the creature was saying yeah okay you picked up on something, so I'll let you see what I look like. Now, what are you going to do about it? You know, it's kind of <laughs> scare like, them to like, shut their mouths. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Well, and this is this is the first time I have ever heard about black-eyed kids morphing into reptilians. I mean, that's an incredible event. Well, it's actually the only one I've got. The closest thing I can think of that's similar is that um, I did have one case. Well, it is kind of similar, but it actually involved um, one of the black-eyed children. Um, and the after the black-eyed kid had gone, the witness you know, just opened the front door like an hour or two later just to make sure still wasn't there. And he said that he saw this sort of large black dog with these glowing red eyes just kind of prowling around the front yard, kind of like the Hound of the Baskervilles. Now, he didn't see the creature change into the black eyed kid or vice versa but he did admittedly feel it was really strange that he should have seen a black eyed kid and then a couple of hours out later he opened the front door to see this sort of creepy black not a dog more like, like a, a black hound. Hound. yeah yeah kind of roaming around and he did make that connection that you know he, he did ask me you know do you think it could be one and the same i was like well i don't know you know i can't answer that question for sure yeah. but it is kind of you know, intriguing that two phenomena should be within, you know, a couple of hours each of each other, 
in the same area, you know, outside the same house. That's true. And then Bluebird just wrote in, and, you know, Bluebird, I'm glad you said this because I remembered this story. I actually wanted to get Billy Corgan on our show to talk about it. Billy Corgan recently mm-hmm. talked and on the record, I believe it was with Howard Stern, about seeing someone shape, shapeshift right in front of him. It was somebody mm-hmm. in the music industry. Are you familiar with that story, Nick? Yeah, it was uh, Billy Corgan from the Smashing Pumpkins. And, um, yes. But, I mean, it's surprising, really, how many people, <laughs> excuse me, do report these kinds of events, whether it's, you know, somebody turning into a reptilian or, a, you know, a black-eyed kid ch- uh, turns into, like, a black dog or the dogman phenomenon. Um, I think what happens is that because we have, like, a long lasting history of, and culture of um, things like werewolves and you know the mythology and the folklore that goes along with it in today's world a lot of people dismiss all this because they can't get past the the image of hollywood movies or tv shows you know and so they don't think it's real but you know shapeshifting covers every culture around the planet and when that happens for me at least you have to begin to accept that with every culture has these stories and this was long before you know aircraft and ships and these you know different cultures weren't even seeing each other you know live thousands of miles of distance away then i think a good case can be made that shapeshifters are real and they're, they're seen quite regularly but people recognize the implications of saying you've seen a shape-shifting creature, and so most people don't talk about it. You know? Yeah, and I think, you know, reading your book, I was kind of overwhelmed thinking about all the different creatures that are around us. You know, mm-hmm. whether people want to believe it or not, they're here. And oh, yes. certainly people that have had personal experiences that have reached out to you and shared their stories know they're real. And you well, know they're I mean, real. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I would point out, I mean, this isn't anything paranormal, but it just just show how nature works. You know, you take a creature like a chameleon, where it can change its color to blend into the background, you know, so a, a, you know, a predator animal doesn't see it and doesn't recognize it for what yeah. it is. So you maybe know, you have other animals experiencing the same thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, we're going to have to take a... Another okay. short break, Nick, didn't mean to interrupt, um, but no, my producer sorry. is waving at me here. <laughs> that <laughs> We're going to take He's another like very short break <laughs> because we want to get back to Nick and all of his great stories here. And again, the name of the book, real quick, is Shapeshifters, Morphing Monsters, and Changing Cryptids. Stay tuned, everybody. You are listening to Supernatural Girls Radio, and we will be right back. Welcome back, everyone, to Supernatural Girls Radio. I'm your host, Patricia Baker, here with my co-host, Patricia Kirkman, PK, and our guest, who we love, Nick Redfern, is with us tonight. He has a new book, Shapeshifters, Morphing Monsters, and Changing Cryptids. It is a terrific book, and we're getting into as many stories as we can with Nick tonight. Now, somebody was asking, Nick, about Owl Man. Can you talk to us a little bit about that creature? Yes. Yeah, well, Owl Man is the British equivalent of Mothman. Now, for people who don't know, Mothman was this creature first seen, or at least by that name, in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, in the uh, latter part of 1966 through December 67. And it was like a, a flying humanoid with these fiery red eyes. And that's basically what the Owl Man is in the UK. It's like a humanoid flying creature with these bright red eyes. And again, like with the uh, Mothman, there's sort of a um, lot of stories of disaster and negativity surrounding this creature. And um, But what's interesting is that there are... In relation to the Alman, there are aspects of shape-shifting. For example, uh, one of the things I talk about is where people have sort of been driving around the little country roads in and around the area in the county of Cornwall where people see um, the the Alman. And they've seen, at first, what they thought was just a regular kind of owl. And then as they got closer, it was as if it morphed into like a a much larger creature, sort of six to seven feet tall. What was weird at the time, 
Yeah, but that, what was weird at the time, they didn't think it was anything strange. It was like, oh, that owl just changed, you know, from three foot, two foot to six foot or whatever. <laughs> and it's only afterwards when they got home that they're like, why didn't I think that was strange? And it was oh. almost as if they, they were somehow mind controlled or hypnotized. Um, so there are a lot of stories like that where as if the owl man has the ability to sort of control the person for whatever reason, we don't know. But there are other cases which cross over into the UFO issue where sometimes people have been, and this is in the US and in the UK, where people have been driving home late at night and when they get home, things kind of feel a little bit odd as if the journey took longer than it should have done and they're a little bit muddled or puzzled. And the only thing they can remember is that they saw this large owl standing at the side of the road, uh, again, sort of about five feet tall, you know, which under normal circumstances would be impossible. But then they'd start getting these weird nightmares and dreams where the wall, where the, um, the owl was actually like a screen memory for an alien abduction. In other words, uh -huh. if the alien was right. saying, you'll remember seeing an owl, Mm -hmm. instead of what really happened. Now, for people who don't know, screen memories are, are a reality. You know, if you have a traumatic experience, the mind covers it up by creating a fantasy. And you don't do it deliberately, you know, it just happens. It's kind of like somebody sees a really bad car accident, but then two weeks later, they cannot remember properly the graphic images of the injuries that the person you know, you know another person might have had because the brain kind of cushions itself you know so you don't you're not constantly caught yeah, up with not those terrible images yeah and it's kind of like that with um deliberately inserted screen memories you know the idea that these aliens if you like could create a screen image so they they haven't physically shape-shifted but the the alien at the edge of the road, in, in terms of the person's mind, it shapeshifts, but into that of like a giant owl. So I think the owl man phenomenon could somehow be tied in with these similar large owl stories that, that tie in with the whole alien abduction phenomenon. That's interesting. Yes. Yeah, there was a movie about abductions in Alaska, and they all had the owl as kind of yeah. their motif that they remembered and very little else, but they were terrified uh, just seeing the owl. So, yeah, that's an interesting screen memory. So it, here's another thing that we wanted to talk to you about. I mean, there's just so many, but the yeah. scariest shapeshifters of all. You have a chapter on that. Who are the scariest ones of all? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not sure if they're the scariest, but they're certainly the most dangerous ones. Um, one of them would be the Wendigo, um, a creature that features prominently in Native American law um, in the sort of northern parts of the U.S. and, and into uh, Canada. Now, there are a lot of stories, and some, some of them kind of clash um, in terms of what the Wendigo is. Now, one theory is that, uh, or one of the belief systems was in Native American law was that if somebody would sort of go rogue and live in the woods and turn to cannibalism, then they would transform into this sort of uh, marauding giant humanoid known as the Wendigo. And um, it would attack people and kill them and eat them. And it would take on from its original human form more like a savage beast-like creature, even though it would have sort of two arms, two legs, and, and a head. Um, now, some people have suggested that maybe, possibly, what people were talking about were actually very violent, dangerous Bigfoot, and that over the years, sightings of these dangerous Bigfoot, you know, looking for food in the winter months, possibly, attacked people, and that possibly cases like that may have been responsible for some of these Wendigo reports. But then there are other stories where, for example, the Wendigo is seen as like a cannibalistic supernatural creature which can take on or, or possess the mind of a human being. So it's kind of like, again, the, I mentioned briefly earlier, in, in relation to the Wendigo, we could be looking at like, not like a shape-shifting 
physically, but a mind shifting where the Wendigo takes over the mind of the person and, and then goes on this killing rampage. Or it could be a combination of all these different factors. But, um, but what it does boil down to is that within Native American law, the, the Wendigo, however you describe it, is sort of a definitive shapeshifter and, um, and dangerous because the, the thing that it was associated with more than anything else was cannibalism. So. Yeah, and you don't is... want to become a victim of a cannibal. So. No, <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> no, nope. we'll take a pass on that experience. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, it, now also with the Wendigo, I've heard that they are consumed with hunger. That's one of the things that that makes them so dangerous. Have you heard that? Yeah, this actually ties in with a similar phenomenon known as the hungry ghost, and um, and they're sort of driven to constantly eat. You know, they have this sort of almost like a starvation mode where they're just crazy for food. And, um, but yeah, again, it's interesting. You can find the stories of similar to the Wendigo, but where they call them, um, the hungry ghosts, you know, the hungry ghosts are quite prevalent in Indian legends and Chinese legends. And again, they're sort of, they're driven to just eat all the time. And, um, but you never, they're never satisfied, you know. So, uh, again, it's interesting that you've got almost parallel stories from Canada, from Alaska, and right across to China and India, and going mm -hmm. back thousands of years when, supposedly, you know, we didn't even know the other countries were there, but their tales were almost identical. It's incredible, and I think we've found ways. It's, scary, it's so scary to some of mm -hmm. us that we found ways to to try to bury it but it's these things are they keep surfacing and more and more people are coming forward because they have the sympathetic ear of people like you who are kind enough to listen and respect right. their story so that makes a big difference the work that you're doing and bringing this out i think nick is extremely important so thank you for what you're doing bringing this to our well, consciousness um, well as i said you know i always I always take the view that without the witnesses we've got nothing to go on and so mm -hmm. i think it's important to respect the witnesses because they're the ones who had the experiences and so that's why you know I'm always happy to listen if somebody says yes you can use the story by real name that's great if they say you can use the story but I'd rather not be named then I'd never do name them you know I, I mm -hmm. think it's always important to have respect for the person who's sharing the story you know and not kind of you know um, go against their their wishes or whatever but sure um, yeah and that's a, a big help to all of us now here's a question from Carrie who's asking do you have any reports from big game hunters who have reported seeing unrecognizable creatures to forest preserve police um, the only things I can think of um, I know a few Bigfoot cases where hunters did officially file a report you know with like the forestry um organizations i know of a few people in the forestry um offices around the u.s who've been approached by people who said they saw a bigfoot type creature now you know for the most part they, they will log their story you know if you, if you officially want to report something they will um they'll file it, you know, in the same way if you call the police, if you say, you say you've seen a UFO and you insist they investigate it or you insist they make a note of it, they will. Um, but there are also, you know, conspiracy theories sur <coughs> surrounding, you know, forestry organizations knowing more about the existence of Bigfoot and um, that there's some sort of cover-up going on. Um, you can find a number of stories like that but that, that's probably the closest I can think of, you know, that, um, that would... Uh, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of uh, mysteries yeah. about disappearances in our national parks, that's for sure, where well, there are questions... that's one of the conspiracies, yeah. The, that's yeah. why they, they kind of play it down, because right. they don't want people panicking that there are, you know, sort of killer Bigfoot running around or whatever. Yeah, and they, they don't want people to stop spending money there. That's really the reason. Yeah. So <laughs> Good point, good point. Well, you know, it's, it's amazing, though, over the years, how each civilization, as you say, China, states, wherever, they all have that background where you'll see uh, sketches or pictures of the same 
same things, but from totally yeah. different aspects that nobody knew the other one existed. And yet when we go back and take a look at it, like the Egyptians with the head of the animal versus, and how many religions or peoples have that type of thing ongoing? Yeah, and I think, as I said, for me, that's one of the most important things when you have similar stories from a massive amount of distance away. Mm -hmm. that's, to me, that's a good point. To, we're not talking about fantasies or folklore. You know, it's a, it's a real phenomenon, even if we're not really sure what the phenomenon right. actually is. Do you have a favorite cryptid, Nick? Um, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> well, I've, I've got a lot of interest in the, the Puerto Rican Chupacabra because I've been there so many times looking for the Chupacabra, probably nine or ten times now, you know, and I like, I like Puerto Rico anyway, you know, San Juan, the capital, sort of this cross between, you know, 400-year-old uh, little areas, you know, um, streets and, you know, even some of the old uh, buildings that there where the pirates were invading and then you've got sort of the new part of San Juan so um, so I guess you know the um, the Chupacabra is one of them but um, the I guess another one as well would be the whole issue of um, the men in black now people think of the men in black you know they think of Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones <laughs> um, but the real they reports do. are much creepier where the men in black are described as sort of um, pale and skinny and very tall and they're these large bulging eyes they hide behind these black sunglasses and they don't actually look human some people think they're sort of um, alien human hybrids other people think you know are they supernatural or time travelers demonic things who knows but i've got a number of cases again kind of like with the black eyed children where the men in black sort of morph into other creatures. Funnily enough, I've got um, a man in black case where, uh, kind of like that um, black eyed children when I mentioned, um, where the witness said the man in black changed into like a black dog. Um, oh, oh you, my you gosh, find, that's different. Yeah, and you can find a lot of these stories that they're known as phantom black dogs in supernatural research. If you Google phantom black dog, you'll find stories from all around the world of these large black dogs with these fiery red eyes and so I've got one case only one but you know it's a really interesting case of a uh, this sort of creepy pale vampire type looking man in black transforming into like this savage hound type creature and interestingly enough um, Arthur Conan Doyle who wrote the uh, Sherlock Holmes novel The Hound of the Baskervilles he was actually inspired to write that novel based on pre-existing legends in the UK of these these phantom oh. black dogs. That, that's what um, pushed him to write the novel. Now, are these hellhounds? Would you call them hellhounds? Yeah. With the yeah. fiery eyes? Yeah, hellhounds sort of the older version, and today they're sort of known as phantom black dogs. But the hellhounds, you know, you can find those going back to, like, ancient Greek mythology where when somebody dies and, you know, they go to the land of the dead, you know, they're, they're taken by these savage, savage dogs. Um, and, you know, paranormal hounds, paranormal dogs that play quite significant roles in a lot of religions. You know, it's sort of like, um, that they're sort of, as I said, a creature that takes you into the next realm, you know, uh, that kind of thing. Yeah. Or it comes after you. I mean, mm -hmm. I've, I've heard stories about hellhounds, and they have teeth that are yes. sharper than metal. So I wouldn't want to be chased by one of them, that's for sure. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's interesting you say about being chased, because there are, it, particularly with the British reports, um, if you go about four or 500 years, if you were to see one of these black dogs, it was supposedly like a precursor for death or tragedy that somebody was going to die who you knew, or you might die yourself. Um, and interestingly enough, if you, again, if you do a Google search, there are a lot of pubs in England called the Black Dog. And, um, and one of the reasons is because if you look back into the history of most of those Black Dog pubs in England, you'll find that there's a legend in that little village or that little town where there was a ghostly Black Dog, and that's why they, they named the pubs after them. So. Wow, that's so fascinating. Now, here's a question. This is from a new guy who's asking, what about pug witches? 
Would you say they would be classified as cryptids? What, if what, sorry? What were they? Puck witches. Have you heard of those? Oh, yeah. Well, um, yeah, I think, you know, kind of like the little people, you mean, that kind of thing. Yeah, but they're yeah. kind of nasty. They call your name <laughs> and they try to trick you yeah. to follow them. And Yeah. No, I think actually you can, personally, I kind of lump all those together, you know, stories of goblins, fairies, the little people, you know, and it's important to know when people talk about fairies today, you know, they think of the image of like a little girl with wings flitting around a Christmas tree, you know, and with a magic wand in her hand. That's sort of the image that people have had of fairies in the last century or so. But if you look at these, the real stories going back centuries, they're actually nothing like that. They were described as sort of little, you know, two to three foot tall humanoid creatures, which very often would come out at night. They would live deep underground in tunnels or under ancient mounds. You know, and they would they would steal food. Sometimes they would be friendly. Sometimes they would be uh, kind of ambivalent. They could be tricks to like, and sometimes they'd be downright dangerous and deadly, depending on the mood that took them. But yeah, I think all of these kind of things, these sort of little people that live in the woods and kind of entrance you and take you away and play games with you, not in a good way. I mean. Um, and it's almost as if they just enjoy taunting the human race. But again, it's like some of the other things I spoke about earlier. You start talking about the little people, they think about fairies and mm -hmm. leprechauns with Irish accents and pots of gold, <laughs> you know, which is... That's no, not the, there. That's, the, that's the folklore version. But stories of very sinister little people, savage little people, can be found all over the place. I've actually got quite a few from the US, uh, particularly the forests of the Northwest, um, you know, Washington State, Oregon, places like that, where I've got several cases where people swore they saw these little people, these little wizened creatures, if you like, and they got a really sense of malevolence for them, the fact that, you know, that somebody had stumbled on them. And um, one of the guys I spoke to actually he was so affected by it that he sort of spent years investigating these reports, not officially as a researcher, but, you know, just on his own, for his own personal interest. And he, he believed, or well, still does believe, that they were like some sort of ancient offshoot of us, the human race, but almost like oh. a pygmy version, that kind of thing. Oh, really? But, uh, My goodness. Yeah, you know, that, that lives outside of society, but he's somehow an ancient type of early humanoid, if you like. Now, let me take us back to Men in Black because I know that's also one of your favorite topics and I know you did a book on it. What do you think they are? Are they androids? I've actually done five books on, on the Men in Black. Five now. of the 30, okay. Yeah, the, fifth, the, fifth one comes out, the fifth one comes out in a few months. But uh, oh, yeah, goodness. I mean, I said it's, it's kind of ironic that everybody thinks the Men in Black are government agents and that comes really from the massive success of the movies. But the movies portray the men in black as working for a government agency. But as I said, most people describe them as extremely pale. You know, the skin's like a sheet of yes, paper. Yes, and, and wearing, um, some of them wearing makeup and stuff. So, yeah, and there's yeah. a number of cases where, you know, people normally wouldn't let them in, but people do let them in late at night as if they've been mind-controlled. The cases where people have fallen sick after being in close proximity to the men in black as if they've been sort of supernaturally infected somehow. I've Ugh. got several cases where people had seen the men in black in their bedroom late at night yeah. right after using Ouija boards as if they'd sort of opened a portal or a doorway. So mm. it's kind of ironic that the least likely explanation for the men in black is that they come from the government. The more, The far more likely explanation is that there's something supernatural, which are, which are tied in with things like the shadow people, um, the black-eyed children, and there's, there's another one known as the hat man. And even um, when people talk today about seeing the slender man, which the slender man kind of looks like um, a man in black as well. And I think all these things are somehow interlinked. You know, they're all man yeah. different manifestations of one phenomenon. Well, I think one of the reasons people think it's from a government agency is because people get 
visits from the men in black after yeah. they've had a UFO experience and right. then they're threatened yeah. by them and told not to talk about it. So there, it does beg the question of why would they say that if they weren't with an agency or some yeah, group? Well, one of the theories is that, you know, it's the phenomenon, the UFO phenomenon itself that doesn't want to be uncovered and so they send out their own agents, if you like. So in other words, they are some sort of agent, but they're not necessarily... Our agents, you know, they're, I see. Else they're not the good guys, huh? Right. Yeah. Uh, mm. I never want to see them. They sound repulsive. <laughs> well, Don't you know, it's funny help? because you also get women in black reports, and um, oh. and the women are kind of the same, where their skin's very pale. Uh, but whereas the men in black wear these old style black fedoras, the women usually have these long black wigs, like in a bang style. Um, and this has given rise to the idea that, again, the women in black don't look entirely human because, you know, they try and cover as much of the face as they can with these wigs. And they also wear the the big uh, sunglasses. And people have said as they've been close to them, they've noticed, you know, the cats, uh, their, their eyes are almost like cat eyes, but bulging, mm. you know, like a vertical slit, uh, mm. that kind of thing. So, um, you know, they're, wow. they're almost like a... They're far less X-Files and far, far more like a gothic horror novel yeah, or something that's like what it that. It looks very attractive. <laughs> well, Nick, we would love for you to come back when your new book comes out about the oh, men yes. in black. Would you promise to do that? Yeah, I've actually got one out before that. The, the next book I've got coming out comes out in February. and it, It's uh, actually a full-length study of the whole Slender Man phenomenon. It's called oh, Slender Man right. Mysteries. We'd like to have you back to that one for sure. All right, well, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank, thank you. you so much for joining us tonight. This has been so delightful. You've scared us half to death. And <laughs> don't have <laughs> thank you so much. I will not open my door. I don't want to hear any knocking. <laughs> yeah. But everybody, I'll have to find again. your address and just, as a joke, like come, you know, fly out <laughs> one night and knock on the door about midnight and just run off, you know what I mean? <laughs> Well, thank you, <laughs> what a guy. Well, again, here's the book. It is a great book, and I'm losing yes, my, my headphones are just flying off my head tonight. Anyways, Shapeshifters, Morphing Monsters, and Changing Cryptids by Nick Redfern. It's a great book, everybody. It Make is. sure you get it. We'll be back great. next week with yeah. another terrific show. Yes. So be sure to join us again, and until then... We'll see you on the Blue Highway. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thanks,